whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Verse 12. For thee which calls, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know when I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have commanded, uh, committed unto him against that day. Now, I know that was a lot of scriptures that I read to you, and you'll probably have to go back and read these scriptures to really to get the gist of that. But, but today we're going to deal with the subject title, The Importance of Investing into This Generation. The Importance yeah. of Investing wow. into This Generation. You know, there are many things that we can talk about today that would rank in the class of importance, but one of the number one things outside of honoring God and loving the Lord with all that want is to impart and to invest in the next generation. One thing that I can rest assured to you today is that you and I on this side will not live forever. Amen. You can preach with me a little bit. You and I will not live forever. Every last one of us, we are in a process of physically deteriorating every single day. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how much I fast. It doesn't matter how many scriptures that you read. That is an appointment with death for every last one of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may live to be 100. You may live to be 70. You may live to be 115. But all I know is that one day on this side, that life will be no more for you and I. And so what, what is it that, that we can do in this life that we live to empower the next generation? Hallelujah. If you don't leave a legacy, you literally aborted the cause and the mission that God has instilled in us that we ought to do and to empower the next generation so the name of Christ can live on in this life. Amen. Amen. That's the reason it's important to invest in your children and not only in your children, but other people's children also. Hallelujah. So the Apostle Paul here, let me just see if this might work because I really want to move around today and I don't want to be bound down behind. Come on. Hallelujah. Well, yeah, I got, hey, we're we working today. So, you know, next week we won't have this problem. We'll have a uh, first class microphone that's going to produce for us the sound that needs to be produced. Amen. 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 So, I hate feeling like I'm bound and I can't move around. You know, I'm, I'm a move around preacher and I just can't, I can't stay boxed in someplace, you know. You know, so one of the things that, uh, that we want to talk about here is, uh, how important when, 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 when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, Timothy had a lot of drama going on in his life. What do you mean a lot of drama? Timothy was a young man when he came to the faith. He was a young man when, when, when God chose him to install him in the church at Ephesus to be pastor. You know, I know firsthand, you know, how difficult it is to be a pastor at a very young age. I started pastoring when I was about 26, I think. 25, and that's been a number of years ago, but, but it was very difficult because people even looked at me different that was older than I is because I was a young boy. Hallelujah. Wow. Hallelujah. But, but one thing that Paul, as a spiritual father, in Timothy's life, can you, can you give me some, uh, some lows and take away some of the highs? I know this microphone is kind of, you know, uh, messed up a little bit, but we'll work it out. Hallelujah. Um, Timothy was a young man and, and, and we have no reference point in the Bible concerning Timothy's biological father. Now, there's no reference point of who his daddy is. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. you, you took too much highs away. Give me a little <laughs> more high, just a little more highs, and you'll be right there. Just leave me alone. Perfect. All right. So, so Timothy, there's no reference in the Bible, no record that I've ever read of Timothy's dad. You know, I mean, we, we know he had a natural father because he, 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 there's no other way that he could have made it into the earth without a natural father. But the Bible explicitly give reference to Timothy's mother and his grandmother. Hallelujah. So, so God brought the Apostle Paul to Timothy's life while Timothy was still a young boy. And Paul mentored Timothy to be the man of God that Tim Timothy became. Amen. So, so Paul starts here in this book by, by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So he began to establish who he was. He said, I'm an apostle, but the only reason I'm an apostle because it's God's will. 
It's God's will. And, and only according to God's promise of life, which is in Christ. See, see, I love the way that Paul writes here. Because Paul don't take any self-credit here. He said, I'm an apostle because it's God's will. And the life that I'm living is because of Christ. You know, that's what God wants us at right now. He said, he said, I am who I am because of God's will. And he said, I am who I am because of Jesus. The life that I'm living is because of Jesus. And see, after we're preaching this thing to you today, I want to inject something into you. You and I are no one outside of Jesus. Let me say it again. You and I, we are no one outside of Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus can we stand. Only in Jesus can we speak about who we are. You can speak about who you are outside of Christ, but it will not last. Mm. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. So he says, Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace and mercy, which we need every day. Grace, mercy, and peace. So when you pray, you need to say, God, give me grace. God, give me mercy. And God, give me peace. But he said, all of this is from God the Father, and it comes from God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. See, all, see, one of the things I want you to understand is that when we read the Bible, every doctrine that we need to be sound is in every scripture. Amen. I mean, he set the order. He said, I am who I am because of God the Father. But I am who I am through Jesus Christ the Son. Yeah. You know, so we can't access God the Father but through Jesus Christ the Son. Right. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And as we're walking out this Christian life, he said that we need grace. We need mercy and we need peace that come from God. Amen. That's what he said, right? He says, he says that I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience. He said, I thank God from my forefathers. All right? I thank God for, for those that came before me with a pure conscience. And without ceasing, I have remembrance of you or thee in my prayers day and night. I mean, he's establishing this thing. He's laying it out. I mean, he, he's laying it out here. He said, I'm thankful to God. And I'm thankful to God, number one, for my forefathers. Come on, just preach with me a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to teach this thing, preach this thing, or scream this thing. It's going to come out one way or the other today. He said, I thank God for my forefathers. So he went from God the Father, God the Son, now his forefathers. Can you see that? I mean, he recognized God the Father, uh -huh. God the Son, whose salvation comes through, uh -huh. and now his forefathers. Uh -huh. He's recognizing he is who he is is because of this order. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You and I are no one outside of this order. Uh -huh. Because every last one of us, we have forefathers. Mm -hmm. And there are inheritance that have been released from our forefathers that have caused us to be able to stand where we are today. Amen. 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 So, he says, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfringed faith that is in you. See, see, this, this is the second letter to Timothy. You know, I mean, just imagine some young preacher in, in a place and they trying to pastor this church. And like, I mean, all the demons in hell are coming against him. And Paul had to write another letter to encourage him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, he's establishing things here. But it, this is a letter of encouragement. He said, I, I know you're going through a hard time, Timothy. I know it's difficult. But I, I, want, I, want, I want to set the presidents. I want, I, want, I want to set this thing in order for you to understand that this is what everything in you is built off of. Right? He said, I greatly desire to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Being mindful of your tears, that I'm going to be filled with joy. But the reason I'm going to be filled with joy, because when I begin to remember, and I'm paraphrasing, this is the King James Version, so you'll hear me say something a little different, but it's what it is. He said, he said, when, when I call to remembrance, when I begin to remember the unfringed faith that is in you. You know, sometimes in life, people have to tell us what's in us. Sometimes in life, people have to remind you who you are. Have anybody ever forgot who you are? You've been swallowed.
caught up in all kind of issues in life has come to sink you, come to cause you to drown. And somebody have to come to you and say, hey, sister, you know you're a woman of God, and I know it's difficult right now, but you know what? You used to speak the scripture all the time, and I know what's in you. So Paul started telling him, I know what's in you. He said, I want to call to remembrance what's in you. Because sometimes we get cloudy. Yeah. Our vision becomes obscure. obscure. Yeah. We can't see the light of day. Yeah. Because problems begin to overtake us. Yeah. But so God will always send somebody. Hallelujah. God will always send somebody. It may be on a Facebook. It may be on a Twitter. It may, I don't know where it may come from. But God will send. It may be the billboard that you're passing by down the road. But God will always speak to you. Yes. Always speak to us. He said, I want to call to remembrance the unfriend's faith that is in thee, which dwell first in your grandma. Now, see, he's doing it all. He said, what's in you, Paul didn't take the credit. But even though he was the one that came and laid hands on Timothy, he didn't take the credit. He said, now, what's in you, it first started in your grandma. Come on now. I want you to see this, because you've got to remember some people that are seen in your life. Right? Because sometimes we forget. Don't forget where you come from. Because if you forget where you come from, you won't be able to see where you're going. And I remember I got, we, my wife and I bought our first house. And I think I might have told this story here before, but I'll tell it again. I remember when we bought our first house, it was in a neighborhood that actually black people couldn't live in the neighborhood for years. You know, and I used to ride uh, my bicycle through a back bush to get to my friend's house because, you know, black people just didn't hang out in the neighborhood. It's just the way that it was in the South. But I bought a house in that same neighborhood. And not, not when the neighborhood went to the dogs. You know I mean? I bought a house in the neighborhood while everybody was still thinking they was on their horse. You know, and they couldn't stop me from moving in. So that's another story. So <laughs> this, is, this is the deal. When, when, when we moved out of the house that we lived in, in the city, the first house we lived in was just a lease house that was in the neighborhood where I grew up at. And uh, I remember I was driving uh, uh, to our new house, and I could see through somebody's yard over the fence the house where I grew up in. And every day I was, I was driving through, and the Lord told me, he said, don't ever forget where you come from. He said, if you forget where you come from, you'll never see where you're going. And I remember, for I mean, I rode that road, and I would always drive, and I would always look through there and see where I used to be, where I grew up, the house, the two-bedroom shack my mom raised five kids in. I would see that house, and I would see the house that we lived in when my wife and I moved back to the city. I mean, it, it was what an attractive house at all. Uh, if any of you have saw Haynesville, you saw the house on Haynesville. That's the house I lived in. So, long story short, I remember as I would come home every day, over time, the, uh, 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 weeds and, and, and stuff started growing up. And the image of that house in the natural started disappearing. And it got to a point that I couldn't even see the house because the weeds that over time had covered up where I could see through. And so God was dealing with me, but he never, ever allowed me to forget where I came from. And so what I want to tell you today don't forget where you come from. You know, sometimes we get money, we get status, and, and we grow in life naturally. And we forget that we used to have shoes with, our, with holes in it. You know, we forget that we used to have to get my eggs and my eggs sandwiches and put bread together. Some of you may have never been there before, but, but, but some of you understand what I'm saying. You forget those days, you know. And so now you're eating filet mignon, you got a great steak, and you're living well, and you forgot the things the way they used to be. And maybe you didn't have that. It's because you have a heritage that was so rich that stopped it, but somebody remember. See, my kids, they don't know anything about that. And they'll never know anything about that. Because guess what? God used me to stop that perverted cycle. And now they're walking in blessing. I walked up on the curse. And God broke the curse. And I appreciate that. But my kids, they don't know what it is to be hungry. They don't know what it is to scramble for food. They don't know what it is to wear shoes with holes in it. They don't know that. And not that I even want them to know that, but as the daddy, I pass my heritage on and tell them where I come from. All my friends that used to come see me when I lived in Mansfield, I didn't just think they pull up at my nice house, and we all get in one big ride. I say, hey, let's ride over here. And I'll pull up into you. I say, this is where I grew up at right here. I say, this is the house because it's still standing. I say, this is the house I grew up in. This is the neighborhood. They say, wow, man, we wouldn't have never thought you came from there. But I wasn't ashamed of it. I wanted them to see where I come from. I wanted them to see what, what, where, I, where I used to be. You know, I never brought any girls home to my mama's house because I was ashamed. And so they never knew where I lived at. You know, but when I met Shonda, and, uh, you know, I knew she was a woman that God gave me, 
Man, we got in that vehicle and we rolled down to the country. This is what they call a country. We rolled down to the country and I pulled up in the yard. I said, this is where I live now, right here. I said, my mama and them, they in there right now. You know, so my mom came out and, you know, uh, all that. And my mama, she said, yeah, I already know you, his wife. Because uh, if he brought a girl here, it got to be real. <laughs> Not that I didn't have girlfriends. I just was shamed of where I lived at. You know, I mean, nobody, no, they never drove over there to pick. I was shamed where I lived at. And some of you probably were shamed where you used to live too. You know, but what, what, guess what? We didn't care about roaches and rats and stuff because I said, you know what? If she's going to marry me, she's going to find out where I'm from anyway. You know, she's going to find out that I was poor and my family do this and do that. So I said, you know, I got to let her know what's up. And so, so, so I said that to just, I want to remind you, don't forget where you come from. You know, just because you got diamonds on your hands and, you know what I mean, all your tiles new every day. You know, come on, see, I mean, that was the time you had to share a tile, a share a piece of something. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, and it's ministering to somebody, but let's just be real. You know, we over here, me and my wife, we're not going to get drunk with a Hollywood spirit, thinking that we've been, well, now we're going to tell you in Hollywood that we was poor. I and mean, we ain't always been where we are right now. Hallelujah. And we're not going to stay where we are right now either. We're in a progressive state. I'm aspiring higher. I just want you to know that. If you don't know it, you won't find out this pastor is aspiring higher. You know, I mean, I'm not going to stay where I'm at financially. I'm not going to stay where I'm at spiritually. We are progressing. And we want to raise up a people that are progressing, aspiring higher. We're not some mediocre people. We're kingdom people. Come on. Amen. Amen. We got a takeover spirit. I'm telling you. You know, I had some cousins, man. They had a takeover spirit. It was bad, you know. It was bad during them days. They didn't know Jesus. Well, we got a kingdom takeover. Come on, Y'all got some cousins like they just come take over your house. Just come take over. Take over everything. Take over everything. It's like, man, where these people come from, man? He just came and took over our place. You know, so we, we got a takeover spirit in the Lord. Amen. You know, we're going to take over. That's what we want to do. Amen. You know, everybody else want to take over. Why, why, why we don't want to take over? And then we we not like the ostrich. We're not gonna put go put our head in a hole. You're coming up in Jesus' name. They're gonna know that we're here. Amen. Hallelujah. They're gonna know that we're in the city, we're in the region. Yes. For us to be reckoned with yes. in the name of Jesus. So Paul said, When I call to remember the unfringed faith that is in thee, which dwelt in your grandmother Lois first, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's in you too. I mean, I mean that, that's some pretty strong words for an apostle to say. Yeah. He said it was in your grandma. So evidently, when Paul met uh, uh, Lois, man, that woman must well, she must was on fire. I mean, she had to be a woman of God for him to make this statement right here. Uh -huh. And then he made he went, he went a little farther and said, "Your mother too, your mama, you know, your mother, whatever you want to call it. your mama." <laughs> you know, she was full of spirit too. He said, so guess what? I ain't even speculating whether it's in you. Uh -huh. sure. He said, because I know it's deposited in you. I mean, you know, if it hit your grandma and it hit you, you, you have to have it in you. Come on, somebody. Amen. it got to be in you. Yeah. It has to be in you. And it has to be in you now. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So, so he said that. He said that now what I want you to do I want you to, I want to put you in remembrance uh, uh, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by putting, uh, putting on of my hands. He said, not only is it in you from your mama, not only is it in you from your grandma, but when I showed up and laid hands on you, I know it's in you. Come on, come on. You ain't going to be able to run from it. You ain't going to be able to run away from it. He said, I know that it's in you. You might not know, but I'm going to remind you that it's in you. Send you. Say, we want to stir this thing up. We're doing it right now. Uh -huh. We want to stir this thing up. I feel a stirring in the building right now. Yeah. Something stirring on the inside of you. Because yeah. somebody has imparted something in your life. A grandmother, a mother, a aunt, a guardian. Somebody has imparted something in your life that's worth keeping. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So if God has not given you the spirit of fear, why did he begin and lead with this after he told him what's in it? Because guess what? He was shrinking in Ephesus. Huh. He had problems in Ephesus. And, and he needed Paul to tell him that God didn't give you the spirit. I can imagine Timothy wanted to run. Paul said, God had given you a spirit of fear, Timothy. He said, but God, I gave you a spirit of love, a spirit of power. 
a spirit of sound mind. Actually, actually the word in the Greek is called timid. He said God didn't give you a timid spirit. Timid means to shrink. So Paul, so, so Timothy was shrinking in Ephesus. It's because of the demonic reprisal that was there was causing them heartache, causing them grief. So why even Timothy was struggling communicating with the people. It's because guess what? It wasn't just sin in the city, it was sin in the church. And so some of the elders and some of the leaders that were standing with Timothy had fallen into sin. I mean, his backup was in sin. People that are supposed to be praying for him had fallen into sin. How do I know? Because when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus, he said there's some stuff that's going on among you that shouldn't even be named among you. People was in homosexuality, in lesbianism, in the church at Ephesus. They just, it just wasn't uh, uh, normal sexual sin. I mean, it was rife. I mean, Diana Artemis worship. I mean, it was, it was rife in Ephesus. You know, and the God of fertility was there. They were doing all kind of crazy stuff there. And so just imagine what was going through Timothy's mind, man. We came in a pass in this church, and these people fell apart. My leadership went fell apart. Get out of here. Paul said, no, stay still. Let's stir up. Let's stir up what's in Let's stir it up. Today we're talking about the importance of investing to the next generation. And guess what? What Lois and Eunice had invested in this man to God, the man to God, the Apostle Paul was calling to remembrance what was already invested into his life. So when the devil comes to try to make you run, my God, we're going to remind you what's in you. When the devil come to try to take you out, we're going to remind you what's in you. And if it's not in you, we're going to get it in you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, we understand the whole deal about this deal being in him. The Bible says, um, the next scripture, it, say, it says that I, verse 7 says, I, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but, but a power of love and a sound mind, but be not thou therefore ashamed. Testimony. Has there anybody ever been in a place where sin was so rapid that you was afraid to say what you knew you should have said? Come on, I'm preaching better. You saying amen? Have anybody anybody ever been in a society where people were so drunk with themselves and drunk with humanity and drunk with sin to where you didn't talk about God because it was such an abundance of chaos around you and you felt like the odd ball out because you were saying something that everybody didn't agree with? So imagine Timothy being the pastor of the church. And they got sin. They do it. The elders people do what they want to do. And he's standing up trying to preach. All of a sudden, you start feeling like, man, you need the Holy Ghost now. I mean, you, you need a good dose of the Holy Ghost. You need the anointing now. It's because now you're outnumbered. You feel like you can't say something because you're outnumbered. Paul told him, don't be ashamed now. Don't be ashamed, because if anybody had ever been ashamed, don't lie. You know, oh no, I've been saved my whole life. I've never been ashamed. It might not be a, it, not, it might not be a shame like you think a shame, but there are sometimes in life you feel like, oh well, I ain't gonna say nothing. Just too many, too many of them doing it. I ain't gonna say nothing. As a matter of fact, I don't even want them to know how I, I don't even want them to know how spiritual I am. Come on, somebody. Come on now. You know, have anybody ever been there? We're talking about a real gospel. Uh -huh. but, 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 but in religion, people don't teach this. Uh -huh. This is relational. Because we go through the hills and the valleys in life right here. Because when you come into a place that's right, I mean, can you preach? Can you still preach? Can you still share? Can you still communicate? Because most of us, we don't want to be laid with some holy road. We don't want to be labeled as somebody that, you know, oh, man, they always talk about Jesus. We don't want to be around them. I mean, just to be quite honest, we don't want to, we don't want to be labeled that. I mean, because we, we, we don't want to be, we want people to be running from us, you know. So, oh, there they go, there they go again, there she go again. You know, now you are saying, well, you know what, I'm just, I, I'm just going, I'm just going to just go with the flow. I ain't going to say nothing about Jesus. <laughs> you know, I love the Lord, but ain't God, I go with it, I ain't going to say nothing. I'll never forget, I was at this funeral of my next door neighbor. He was a Mormon. And uh, his wife had died. 
And every time I go somewhere, man, it's like God always put me on the spot. It's like I said, you know, I'm going to this, I'm going to this deal. I told my wife, I'm, I'm hanging at the back. I'm not saying nothing because I don't want to be in a place for me to spoil this film. I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm always the spoiler. Seriously. I mean, it's not like I be planning it. I'm like, just let me just stay back. You know, he my neighbor. His wife did. I still got to live next door to this guy. So let me just, you know, he knew I was a preacher. And he knew I was a Holy Ghost. He knew I was a Holy Ghost field preacher. So let me just stay back here in the back. So him and his buddy, they're, they're, they're conducting the service, a little graveside service. And there was quite a number of people there. And I'm like, I'm back. I'm shrinking. Because I'm like, you know, I'm saved, but, you know, just let me be saved back here by myself. You know, just, just, just leave me alone, you know. Are y'all hot, cold? What, what are y'all? Is it human in here or is it not? I still have the Louisiana human. Is it human in here? It's not human? Okay. Because I told Brother Paul, I said, man, we're just going to let that thing up, man, experience California weather. <laughs> y'all want some weed to blow on y'all? We'll open it up. You know, it's nice and cool out there, right? It is. It's hot. It's got hot. Okay, all right. Y'all fine, all right. I'm just making sure. That's that spirit, isn't it? That's what it is. Amen, amen. I mean, I spent a week in Louisiana, man. That humidity put me down. I was like, I got to get back to the desert. Hallelujah. So, I mean, I'm in a situation here. And I'm there at this field. I'm just hanging in the back, you know. I mean, I'm like, okay, I don't want to be seen. You know, but kind of see me. They know me and support me. But I don't want to be seen. And all of a sudden, they started doing the prayer. They say, hey, my neighbor, Pastor Regis, is at the bank. Won't you come up here and invoke the spirit for us? Oh, wow. That's what he said. It's like, I, nobody had ever never used that coming out. I ain't never heard nobody besides invoking demons. You know? <laughs> I never heard this type of language. Come on, invoke the spirit for us. And I said, okay, I'm going up there, and I'm going to pray, and I'm coming back, and I'm sitting down. This is what I'm telling God. This is me and God talking. I'm coming back. Sit down. Okay. You know, I mean, I'm saying, okay. I get up there and say, oh, man, here we go. You know, I'm like, I'm not trying to be spiritual. I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to feel nothing. I'm just going to follow the name of Jesus. I'm going to thank you. Bless this thing. Bless this thing. You know, I'm going up there. And all of a sudden, I get up there and I pray. I say, okay, God. Won't you share a few words with us, uh, Pastor? Now, I'm on the spot in front of all these people. Don't ask me to share. <laughs> Man. You know, because they're up there talking all this weird stuff. I'm telling you, I'm not hitting on nobody religion, but, but I already knew it was going to be weird when we got there. Because we had had weird, you know, my neighbor, Mr. Jim and I, it, it was like Tim, uh, uh, the two men, and uh, what was the neighbor name? The neighbor. Tim, the neighbor, the two man neighbor, whatever. He would stand on his fence. I would stand on my fence. And we would talk. We would talk about Jesus. And he would talk about the heavenly mother. And he would talk about all this stuff, you know, that, that he, he talked. And I would say, well, you know, Brother Jimmy, this is what the Bible says. Well, and he would talk about, you know, all this, a lot of stuff. I said, well, you know, so here we are at this funeral with his wife. I know they're going to be going straight weird. I know it's going to be stuff that ain't right. And there I am. I got to straighten stuff out. You know. And uh, But anyway, I ended up getting out of it. You know, I did sell a few little deals, and I just tried to keep it Jesus. And, and I went back, and I told my wife, I said, man, God got me over there. And so everywhere I would go, I'm telling you, they would pick me out everywhere. I'm everywhere I go. I mean, everywhere we go. We went down to the city of Ontario. This, we in a place we don't know about. And the people want to pick me and my family. Everywhere we go. They got a thousand people. Hey, we want that kid. Oh, won't you come up? Won't you say something? It's like everywhere we go. God is always calling me to the forefront. And so all I'm saying, guys, is there are some times that you won't say nothing. Because you know when you say something, it's going to ruffle bear feathers. You know, you know when you say something that is not going to be, you know, agreeable, you know. They invited me to speak at this black history uh, program they have in Louisiana every year. And all of a sudden they invited me to like speak or pray or do something. I was like, man, you know, because all these group of people, they nice people. They got a lot of stuff that they need to work out. And, you know, I was like, man, for them to invite me, I'm like, what do they want to hear? Because they know what I represent. And so here I am, standing in front of these people with this microphone. I was thinking about all the hundreds of things that I'm not going to say. <laughs> 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 oh, 
already got enough enemies, y'all. You know, I mean, it's like, ah, that pastor, that's Jim Jones, you know. You know what I mean? Because when you start talking about the Holy Ghost and all kind of stuff and, you know, getting all charismatic, people start labeling you, you know. They start saying, you know, you're one of them wackos or whatever. That, that ain't always true. You know, so there I am. So that's enough about that. But sometimes we start shrinking. Because, we, we, you know, our testimony, you know, we got a testimony. It's like, oh, I just keep running with that. You know, I'm not on the clock. I come in place, I don't even tell people who I am sometimes. Now, anyway. Like, hey, how you doing? I'm, hey, how you doing? What's your name? I'm Regis. I'm Brother Regis. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't even eat anywhere. I mean, every restaurant we go, it's like, man, we, we lead the waiters and everybody to do deliverance. You know, when we was at a restaurant, they shut the whole back side of the restaurant. All the workers left, and they gathered around me and my white table. I was like, man, y'all got to get back to work, right? Tell us more. Can you pray with us? And so then we were at the restaurant, church breaking out. I said, man, can we just have dinner? You know, man, we knew it was something different about you. And that's good. But there are sometimes you feel like, There my wife, though, you know, she'll break out. We, we went to, uh, we went out to eat uh, in Irvine a couple weeks ago, and these people came out. It, it was private. Me, Pastor Doug, Pastor Susan, and my wife, we just ate dinner and came out, sitting outside of this hotel on the balcony. And uh, around this, like, fire, and it was kind of cool. And all of a sudden, you know, we're just private, just, you know, wrapping it up, eating a cookie, drinking some hot coffee or something. And all of a sudden, these people come out. They started infiltrating us. It just started infiltrating us. They, they said a few little weird deals. And before long, everybody in this little group out there said, all right, that, before long, my wife was singing hymns, y'all. And before long, we were sharing the gospel. You know, it was weird. It was weird. You know, but God will always put you on the spot, especially if it's in you for real. Amen? All right. So, uh, he said, God is not giving you a spirit of fear. But a spirit of love, power, Simon, he said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul said, don't be ashamed of me, and don't be ashamed of Jesus. Why would Timothy be ashamed of Paul? Anybody know? He didn't want, to, he, he didn't want nobody to know that he was running with Paul, because everybody knew about Paul. It's like, man, hey, Paul, who? Paul, we're going to kill you, because they hated Paul. Everywhere Paul went, he was causing ripples in the water. And so Paul had to tell him, don't be ashamed of Jesus and don't be ashamed of me. <laughs> Have anybody ever saw this? Have you ever seen this? It's just been shown to you now. He said, don't be ashamed. He said, he said but be thou a part of oh, Jesus, Paul. He said, but be thou a partaker of affliction. He was being straight up. He said, now, it's in you. Your mom, your grandma, even me. Now, don't be afraid anymore. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. So whatever afflictions coming your way, just eat. Oh, how many of us like that? I mean, he called it clean, right? He said, whatever going to come your way, as a result of your testimony, just eat. Come on, I'm preaching better than you said, amen. It's about to heat up in here. I'm going to preach about 20 more minutes. But it's about to heat up. Because we are in a society that is so seeker friendly to where you don't want people to know that you are associated with certain people. Come on. It's because you know if you mention certain people's name, that it's going to bring greater persecution against you. Many of us, we ain't willing to suffer the way we say we are. God got to help us. He got to help us, y'all. Come on. God has to help us. None of us like persecution. And the persecutions that are coming are greater. I walked in the office one day. It's called Form Bureau Bank. Oh, Form Bureau Insurance. I walked in. This lady was in there, and God has given me this gift. If somebody is Jewish or, or, or even Arab, I mean, I know it. I mean, they, they, they can be black. I walk in, and automatically, whatever is on them, God, God shows it to me. So I walked in. This lady was standing there, and uh, I was like, man, the Holy Spirit started saying, he, she, he said, she's Jewish. This is Mansfield. She 
work like in the, in the country. So she was like, literally, she wasn't in the city on bureau as like in Stonewall. You know, you know what Stonewall is. Uh, so I walked in the building and she was in the kitchen was, you know, like, when I walked in, and looked at the lady, I said, uh, hey, how you doing? That's all I was going to say. You know, I don't want to say, I, you know, I don't want to say nothing else to her. The Holy Spirit said she was Jewish. So I asked her. Because God told me to love you. She says, Yeah, we are. My family is Jewish. But they hide out in Louisiana in the backwoods. Because they didn't want people to they, they, she didn't want nobody to know she's Jewish. Because of anti-Semitism. So I'm like, wow, this is weird. But it's for real. And so 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 I, I'm, I'm in this situation to where you know I understand. How some Jews feel. It's because now they hide out everywhere. It's because people want to kill them. People want to come against them. You know, because of because the, uh, the story of David. Because any association with Israel, the world don't like them. And so now, if people stand with Israel, you're the enemy. Because Israel is like this evil nation. That's what the world says. And it's like, we're going to blow you up. A lot of people don't stand with the nation of Israel. And so the same thing in our Christianity. There's sometimes in life that, you know, we don't, we're not outspoken about who we are. We don't share with people that, oh, I am a Christian. You know, some of us, we don't possess that bold to say, I'm, I'm a Holy Ghost filled Christian. Some of us, we're just there and, you know, people find out later that you're Christian. And not that you got to walk around with a sign on you saying you're Christian. I mean, but, but God has made you and I to be believers to give us a Opportunity to minister to people that's non believers so they can be saved. Amen? Amen. All right. So, so he said, Be a partake of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who have saved us and called us unto a holy calling, not according to the works, but according to his own purpose and his own grace, which was given us in Jesus Christ, a Christ Jesus, before the world began. So, Paul was telling me, It ain't about you, Timothy. I know you're going through a hard time, but it ain't about you. This stuff was given to us from the beginning by Jesus, and we just going to have to suffer. <coughs> so, when you go through hardship, guess what? You're going to be all right. Because, guess what? We have been called to suffer. Yeah, we've been called to a good life too. But you and I have been called to hardship for the gospel. The world don't love, if the world loves you, you are in trouble. Jesus said, the world didn't love me, and they ain't gonna love you. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said they rejected me and they're gonna reject you. So quit trying to make yourself fit. In a world that ain't your world anyway. We live here, but it's not our world. And we want to raise up our children to understand that this world is not your friend. We were sitting there having dinner a few nights ago. Well, on, on uh, what is it, Saturday, Sunday, right? I lose track of days because every day is full of work. Jesus, give us grace. Amen. All right. My kids, we sit at the table eating dinner. As we were sitting there, my subject title was Jesus. Because I felt at that moment that I could communicate to my kids about, and I've been so, we've been sowing seeds, but I just, I said, hey guys, this is the deal. Even seven years ago, my wife is sitting there, you know, we, we eat dinner together. We sit down at the table, we'll talk about things later. Sit down with your kids, eat dinner with your kids. You know, don't go in one room, you go in another. Build family relationship. So we're sitting there eating dinner. My kids, we had sandwiches. And we just got back in, and my wife had bought some big subway, and everybody eating sandwiches. You know, Steve was throwing bread, sandwiches throwing bread. We don't want the bread. The bread too long. The meat cold. You know, all that kid stuff. So, I was sitting there. I said, guys, let's let's do, let's talk about this. I say, Disney is all about magic. It's all about witchery. Because my kids start 
talking about this abracadabra magic stuff. And I say, God hates magic. So all this stuff. And the, and the way we got on it is because of my son, Seth, they stayed with their grandma while they were in Louisiana. And the reason he wanted to stay is because he had a, a room with his own TV. <laughs> I mean, he has a television demon. And my daughter Reagan met me one day when we came back to Mansfield because we were living in Shreveport, 30 miles north of there. And we got back to Mansfield. And she said, Dad, Seth was watching Pac-Man. Seth was watching Power Rangers. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so my kids asked me, what's bad about Pac-Man? We grew up on Pac-Man. The reason I stopped my kids from watching Pac-Man is because the ghosts and the spook stuff start keeping them up. Heidi was all, they were all scared talking about ghosts and fear. And I said, okay, we're going to divorce ourselves from Pac-Man. Because now I'm fighting a demon, a, a, a demonic demon of fear in the house behind Pac-Man. So we cut Pac-Man loose. I said, Dad, what's evil about Power Rangers? Well, Power Rangers is not really evil. I said, Sam cannot stop kicking and hitting people because of Power Rangers. <laughs> so I said, we're going to cut his power source. <laughs> and Miss Steven think they're going to kick and slap everybody. And so I said, we got to detoxify our children from this stuff. I started talking about Disney, all the magic stuff. I said, Wally Kazam is all about magic. Say, Mickey Mouse, we got the evil Mickey now. You know, Mickey Mouse is all about magic. And we go to Disney. We go to Disneyland. Jesus, help us. Say, Dora is all about magic. So we go back to the ring and say, well, this one is not about I said, all the other shows, all these other real-life TV shows, it's about relationships, girlfriends, and boyfriends, and who you like. Jesus, help us. Shake it up. And cross-dressing. Zach and Cody, he's cross-dressing. Come on, am I talking to any parents yet? So I'm explaining to them the agenda of the end. Reagan, she gets it. She gets it. Seth gets it, because this is what I say. And this is all I'm going to say about my kids, because I don't want to expose too much stuff about them. I want them to give them that proper name. Because I even recommend our pastor, I said, don't talk about your kids across the pulpit. You know what I mean? We can't talk about our kids in pulpit. I, 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 I told Seth, I say, say, you're supposed to be a Christian boy. And I said, you were watching those shows when we told you not to watch those shows. I said, that's okay. Because the Christians don't do that. And it's wrong. And Seth, he's tempted. He drops his head. And tears start coming out of his eyes. And I didn't feel bad. I was glad because of conviction. I said, Lord, if I can get my kids to have a real relationship with you to where they are convicted behind when they do wrong things as a Christian, then we are on our way. I gotta stand and police them the rest of their life. When they get out of our house, they're gonna do whatever they want to do. But if I can get them to have conviction now. Last night I went around and I, I kneeled down beside the bed and I prayed for Stephen for eight hours and seven hours. I wanted to pray for Dr. Mark right now. But when I didn't bed, kneel down, I said, You pray something. Yeah, I pray, pray for Dr. Mark. I said, Get up, get in the bed. So I went in the room. And I realized something, guys. You know, when we had Reagan, me, my son, and Kari, you know, we were some of you guys have met, Kari, Reagan, and Seth. A night didn't go by without me sitting down and kneeling down and leading them in prayer. So Heidi came along, Stephen came along, now Sammy has come along, y'all came along in between now. He used to be in the house, he's out of the house now. Your tanner house, uh, you know, so so all these things came along, you know. You came along, other church people came along, traveling came along, traveling to countries, everything came along. You 
And all of a sudden, Dad makes it to the bedroom to kneel down to pray that these three left. Reagan, she has the foundation. Seb has the foundation. It's because I was able, we were able to do that together. And so I realized that, that there was a deficiency, and the deficiency is because, was because of my wife and I. You know, we, we had all these kids, and so being tired has literally excused us from some of our duties is because we're outnumbered. But the truth is we're not excused. The truth is that we got to reassemble. The truth is that we got to reassess and we got to teach these children the way Paul said that Timothy had the call. Guys, are you with me here today? All right. So, so we prayed. And so I added in all the other stuff because I teach my kids to pray about the blood. I teach my kids to pray about protection. I teach my kids to rebuke the devil. I mean, you know, we'll train you. Like we teach our kids, we teach our kids warfare. Because there's something going on with daddy. I want my kids standing over me declaring the blood of Jesus Christ. I want my kids standing over me declaring that God's hand is upon me. And devil, you are a liar. So my kids, they speak that type of language. You know, devil, you are a liar. We rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. You know, we teach our kids that type of language. You know, amen. We teach, we teach them warfare. You know, we teach them how to pray. Stuff start going, let's pray, everybody. Let's pray. Because when something going on, you want somebody around you that can pray. Amen. 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 I mean, we'll grab hands and start touching and agreeing. You know, we'll declare the word of God. Amen. And that's the way it has to be. Got to build the next generation. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, and I'm almost through here. Proverbs 13, 22, it says a good man leaveth he leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaveth his family, his children, an inheritance. When we think about this scripture, we only think about money. Right? Money is great. I wish somebody would have died and left me money. Amen. And when my day's over here, my kids are never going to have to worry about money because we got them set up. You know, you make sure you're the million dollar man or 300,000 or 500,000, whatever. Leave them some money. You know, I told my wife, if I go before you, y'all can cry and walk in your eyes with dollars. <laughs> Amen. Maybe some people, oh, you know, who's going to spend my, somebody else going to drive that car. Somebody else going to sleep in that bed. You just enjoy the bed while you got it. And you enjoy the car while you got it. Because when you go, you go. And I told her, if you go before me, I'm going to miss you. You can't be replaced. But by God, we got a couple bucks to wipe our eyes when to eat. I am not being insensitive, guys. I'm just telling you the truth. You say you shouldn't say that in church. What's what I'm going to say? I mean, because by golly, one of us is going to leave one day. If Jesus tarry, I hope it's seven, eight years from now. But I'm not, I'm not going to be in heaven one day she got married again. I hope she did. And she's not going to be in heaven one day she's going to get married. My God, just get whatever. If you want to be alone until Jesus comes, let it be. But make sure everybody's okay. You know, I'm going to be with the Lord. You're struggling to play, pay uh, Edison. That ain't right, y'all. That ain't right. And we want to teach you better. Amen. You know, I mean, you know, we're going to set it up to where she can just vacation the rest of our life. Or me. You know, <laughs> you know, just vacation. Fly around the world. Where you work at? I don't work anywhere. You know, God made a way. <laughs> amen. 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 I'm just telling you the truth, guys. You know, to enjoy life. You know, that, but, but, but the true inheritance here is wealth spiritually. Spiritually. Amen. So, so we want to make sure we're leaving an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance. What is an inheritance? You want to leave, you want to leave a legacy. Anybody want to leave a legacy? If you don't, we want to get into you today. We want to leave a legacy. Anything that's handed down from the past, uh, from your ancestors or predecessors, is cons considered to be a legacy. We must focus on being a worthy example. The Bible says in Titus 2, verse 1 through 8. And I'm going to read this straight out of the message version. I wish I had time to go through every single scripture. My God, I wish I did. 
But you can go through every single scripture. All right. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. In the message version, it says, your job is to speak out on the things that make for solid doctrine. Guide the older men into lives of temperance, dignity, wisdom, into healthy faith, love, and endurance. Guide older women into lives of reverence so they end up as so they end up as neither gossips nor drunks, but models of goodness. I love this, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. By looking at them, the younger women will know how to love their husbands. And the children be virtuous and pure and keep a good house. This is in the Bible, y'all. It is. Anybody read it later? It's my foundation. Be good wives. We don't want anybody looking down on we don't want anybody looking down on God's message because of their behavior. Also, guide the young men to live disciplined lives. But mostly, show them all this by doing it yourself. Incorruptible in your teaching. Your words, solid and sane. Then anyone who is dead set against us when he finds nothing weird or misguided, might eventually come around. And this is this is the message version of Titus too. Now you ought to, I mean, you, if you go through the King James version, they say you should be chaste, you should be this. I mean, the King James is like, uh, oh, it's behind me. But the King James is like, you know, we can we can dissect those words, man. We won't have time for that. Only have five more minutes. All right. So guys, this is how we're supposed to be living. Lois lived like this. You and live like it because Paul said it. Say, Timothy, you got your foundation from your grandma. You got your foundation from your, your mother. And now I've come into your life as a father, and when you didn't have a father, now you have a father to bring balance in your life. Guess what? I grew up without a dad. I didn't have a father growing up. I had a grandfather, but I, I, I didn't only met my dad, my biological father, I only met my dad like 13 years ago. For the first time, I never seen my dad, never knew my dad in my whole life. And I met him for the first time. But you know what? I had men that grew up around me that they, they, their lifestyles wasn't too godly. And, and I, you know, embraced whatever they was doing. And so I started doing what I saw. But one day, man, my granddad got saved. My granddad, he was old Pentecostal. Man. He, got, he got full of Holy Ghost. And he was a man of honor. He was a man of righteousness. He was a man of holiness. And I looked at him. And I, and I embraced what he was doing. My pastor, that one of my pastors that we had, he was a man of God. He was the image that I had uh, to see what it was to love a woman. He was the image that I had to see what it was to love and raise your kids up in the eminence of the Lord. I mean, how do I love my wife? The way he treated his wife was the way I treated mine. It's because he was a good example. And it lined up with the word of God. So, guys, we got to get on our job, parents. Grandparents, uncles, cousins, whatever you are, aunts, you got to get on your job because somebody is watching you. Amen. Come on, guys. Amen. 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 I want to give you one last scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go there. We can go look at it together. I'm going to close my laptop. Is anybody getting anything today? Yeah. I hope you're being blessed up in this place today because we're going to change the world. But we're going to change the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to change the world through the Bible. Amen. We're not going to change it with our ideas and our thoughts and our ways. No. We're going to change it the way God say change it. According to his word. Amen. The Holy Spirit is in this building. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 7. Well, verse 6. Well, verse 5. I'll just read the whole chapter. I love it. You know, our school that we had in Louisiana, Deuteronomy chapter 6 was the bedrock of that school. Because this is what we believe. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. 
and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. I love it, Jesus. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. And you shall talk of them when thou set it in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou lay it down, and when thou rise it up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. For us, it means that whatever you put your hand to. Amen. For them, they bind it in a different way. But for us, that's what it, whatever you put your hand to, you make sure it's God's word. It says, and they shall be as frontly between thine eyes. You see a lot of Jews, they, they wear these boxes between their eyes. But you know what? If you got your eyes fixed on God and on the word of God, you'll do what does said the Lord. Jesus Christ said, if your mind is stayed on me, it'll, I'll keep you in perfect peace. Why did I read this scripture? Because we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as a people. You might not be a mom. You might not be a dad. But we have a responsibility from God. Amen? And that responsibility is to visibly live before people the way God say live before them. To be holy. To be righteous. To be people of dignity. To be people of integrity. People of substance. What you say should carry weight in any circle. In any day. If somebody say you said it, they shouldn't even have to second guess. They say, my God, if she said it, you can take it to the bank. If he said it, you can take it to the bank. But in the body of Christ, we don't have substance anymore. In the body of Christ, we don't have a mind to where people look at us and understand that we are who we say we are. People always having to second guess whether we are legitimate or not. But the devil is a liar. You need to say this day is the day of the Lord. This day. that if people want to see what Christ looked like, they can look at me. It's Christ and the hope of glory that's on the inside of me. The Bible said any good works that flow through you is produced by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in the book of Philippians. We got to get to the place where the kingdom is being demonstrated through us. Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, I come to you with not, not with words of cunning men wisdom, but I come to you in demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody in this place that has a clear understanding that the Lord God of Israel be God on the inside of you? Righteousness should be the fruit of, fruit of your life. The yeah. way you live should precede yeah. what your mouth says. Don't let your mouth speak it before your life show it. Let your life show it. Then let your mouth speak. Your yeah. life speak volumes. It yeah. speaks more than your mouth do. Somebody give God praise in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, you want to praise him in this place. We want to pray today, Lord. We want to pray. Yeah. And we want to ask God to help us. Help yeah. our tongue, God. Yeah. Help our demonstration, God. Yeah. You don't want to walk around and be a naysayer. You don't want to walk around and speak filth and disrespect and dishonor out of your mouth. You want to walk around and speak words that are wholesome, words that are substance. The Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 4, he said, think on these things. Think on things that are wholesome. Think on things that have a good report. When the word come out of your mouth, let it be words of substance that's going to be a healing, a, a healing bomb to a nation. And say, anybody that got healing in their mouth? Anybody got healing in their mouth? I want to be a person that heals. I don't want to be a person that speak condemnation, a person that speak uh, curses. I want to speak blessing. I want to bless people. Bless people with your words in season and out of season. Somebody give God praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. Can you tell Pastor Sean to come, please? We give you praise. Let's stand up in this place right now. Let's stand in this place right now. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord God, that your ways are perfect, God. Lord God, if we need an example, we can look to you. You said, Jesus, that you were, and we know that you were the perfect example. You told Paul, you said, Paul, be an example to the people. You told Timothy, be an example to the people. You told Titus, be an example to the people. That when the people look at you, that they got a great reference point. That they can look and see something of substance, something of wholesomeness. And Lord, we pray today, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that we shall be everything that you've designed for us to be in this season, we give you all the praise. We give you all the honor, Lord. We give you honor, Lord, and we thank you for being God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we begin to open up this deal to pray for people, I want to say this right here. My wife and I, we met um, in November of uh, 2000. I got saved in 2000. I got saved October 7, 2000. 
I met my wife in the month of November 2000. God was working a work. I realized from the Lord that she was my wife in February of 2001. And all of a sudden, I just fell in love because God told me this was the woman that I created for you. And from that, from that day, we got married September 23rd, 2001. Um, we got married. The next, a few months later, we got married. You can sit down, sister Charlene. We got married in 2001. And that sparkle that came in my eye when I met her, that sparkle is still there. I told her when I look at her, I still hear music. When I look at her, the wind blows and light. Because when I met her, in that season of life, I met Jesus, just, just to keep with In that season of my life, I met Jesus. And after Jesus, God gave me a woman. And I feel like the Lord looked at me and said, it's not good for Regis to be alone. Because I, I, very possible I could have ended up back in sin. Because that used to be one of the problems I had when, when I grew up. And so God gave me a woman. Immediately after salvation, when God changed my world, he gave me a woman. Well, he gave me a wife. And we got married. And that love has grown. And, and, and early in our marriage, we had our challenges because I was small. And I thought things were supposed to go a certain way. You know, until I realized things, it wasn't my world. Yeah, no, God changed it. Yeah, God changed it. But I had to realize that it wasn't my world. You know, that she wasn't something I was supposed to be controlling and telling what to do. You know, I mean, when she didn't obey, I was like, okay, let's, we're going to divorce. Because I was immature. I didn't have somebody, a reference point, somebody to teach me. You know, because my life, you know, if you was my girlfriend, my woman, whatever, you kind of done what I wanted you to do. You know, because that's the culture that we was raised in. And not that we were dumb and ear, but, you know, I mean, nobody told me no. You know, nobody said no. It's not going to go like that. You know, it was always yes, you know, because it was always a lie. And God taught me. And he taught me what unity meant. He taught me what it was to be a team. He taught me what it was to walk together with your helpmate. You know, not doormat helpmate. And she's supposed to be on my side to compliment. And we're supposed to accomplish things together. Why am I sharing this? I didn't pre-think this. God wants you to hear this. We've had so many people come and look at our life and look at us and say, man, y'all look so happy. Guess what? We are. Man, y'all look in love. Yeah, we are. And it's our prayer in Jesus' name that we continue to do what we're supposed to do so God can continue to bless that. When people look at our family and they say, man, you got a great family. I say, it's because of the Lord. And people want to get married because they look at our marriage. People want to have children because of our, look at our kids. One of our pastors, which is like a dad to me, D. Wood Jones, which you guys are meeting, he and his wife has five kids, and their family is so rich with wealth and love and, and their marriage. I mean, they've been married for 30 some years, and man, they, they spark. They look at one another, and they have a spark in their eye. And we was provoked to have more children because they had kids, and they, they're older, they're in their mid-50s, late 50s. They said, if God did it through y'all, God can do it through and so what I'm saying today, guys, we're talking about the importance of investing into the next generation. The way you live is investing. Let your kids see a holy woman of God. Let your children see a holy man of God. Let your nieces and nephews and people around you see holy men and women of God. I want you to look at your life and evaluate your life, and I want you to identify by the power of the Holy Spirit what's in your life that's out of order. I want you to look at yourself. It may be your attitude. You know, I want, I want, I want my kids to... I want my kids to honor me. See, you know what I mean? The Holy Spirit thinks just boom. You know what? You just catch it and roll. You know, because God is good. God is good. And so the deal, the deal is, the deal is, you know what I mean? We, we got kids. We know how to handle it, you know? We just roll. We just flow. You know, we spend time on another do. No. We just do. So the deal is, guys, is that the Holy Spirit will cause you to identify what's wrong in your life. Because guess what? The worst thing that you can be is to be a stumbling block to somebody else. Don't allow people and systems of this world to poison your children. Man, I sound in Louisiana. Poison. Poison your children. Don't let them poison you. Be the woman of God that called you to be. Be the man of God that God called you to be. Invest into these kids. Don't let them run over you. Discipline your kids in love. 
We believe in discipline and discipline your kids in love. Let them know that the world don't revolve around them. Let them know that the world revolves around Jesus. Because there is no world outside of Jesus. So I want to pray over the parents. I want to pray over every person here. And we just want to bless you today. That God has made you and he's put you and I in this earth for such a time as now. Men and women of God, honor your mother and father. If you don't honor your mother and father, how do you expect your kids to honor you? You don't honor other people. How do you expect somebody to honor you? Don't do it. Don't do it. Be cordial with everybody. Honor people. Respect people. I remember my grandma used to say, or my great dad used to say, he said, even a dog deserves respect. Let's respect one another.